So I'm aware that it's quite a mixed audience. Some of you will have some experience of talking to patients before, during and after being in clinical studies, but some of you perhaps haven't had a much experience of uh, what's out there and what it's like and what it's all about getting patients uh, into them. So I'm going to try and give a bit of an overview, try and give you a taste of what's going on right now in terms of clinical studies. Um, and then a few useful contacts, I hope, at the end in terms of what might be useful if patients ask you questions about specific, uh, uh, about specific studies. So I thought I should start just by reminding everybody about standard of care in glioma particularly, because actually things have changed quite a lot in the last few years. Um, in a way it's made things more straightforward, but I'll just remind people about that. I'll talk to you a little bit about what's new in terms of some of the background biology that's led to some of the clinical trials that are going on at the moment. And then I'll go through some of the studies, particularly the ones that I know are big recruiters in the UK, uh, and the ones that we get asked about from the uh, patient's perspective uh, all the time. So standards of care, uh, of course, multidisciplinary management is always the answer for standard of care. Um, it used to be the case that we recommended surgery and then combined chemo radiotherapy predominantly in our grade 4 glioblastoma patients. But essentially the easy answer for most glioma patients at the moment is that they all get maximal surgery and pretty much chemo radiotherapy. And that's the um, outcome of a series of clinical trials that have come out in the last few years that have meant that now our older patients with GBM, so patients over 70, there's evidence now that they also do better if you combine chemotherapy and radiotherapy. There's good evidence now that in some of the grade 3 tumours uh, that they also benefit from temozolomide as well as radiotherapy. Um, and there's this um, ever increasing evidence base really uh, in the oligodendroglial tumours, both grade 2 and grade 3. Um, that chemotherapy adds significantly to what's already generally a very good prognosis uh, for those patients. So actually in this day and age it's sort of hard to think about who would not get chemotherapy. You can imagine that's changed the um, framework a little bit and it's certainly added significantly to um, the pressures on the, uh, on the clinic. For good reasons though, because this is all about improving how these patients do. The other thing that's changed, and I'm a bit nervous, I know I've got a neuropathologist in the room now, so I'm not getting any detail on here. <laughs> the other thing that we need to be aware of, though, is that the um, basic um, neuropathological diagnosis, the way that we diagnose these tumours has also changed in a really quite dramatic way, recently <coughs> because of the um, recent um, uh, uh, WHO classification. Um, so some diseases have disappeared off the horizon. So glyomatosis cerebrali is no longer uh, a separate diagnostic entity, and neither are the mixed oligoastrocytomas. Um, and the, the new framework is that for the diagnosis of all gliomas now, you need um, a combination of what the neuropathologist sees down the microscope, which is what we generally relied on for making a um, classification, so either GBM or oligodendroglion or whatever, you not only need that, but you also need the molecular pathology, because we're relying more and more and more on the molecular characteristics of these tumours to tell us really how these tumours will or won't behave. Um, and this is just an example of why uh, that has changed. So this is a publication that came out uh, a couple of years ago now, and this is looking at uh, low-grade tumours, um, but dividing these tumours up in terms of outcomes, so this is survival in years, versus percentage, so this is like a, a kaplan meyer survival curve. But these tumours have been divided up not by conventional um, uh, histopathological subtypes, but by their molecular characteristics, so their mutational profile, essentially. And what you can see here is that there are some very distinct differences across this uh, group of tumours. So you can see there's a group here uh, with TERP mutations who do extraordinarily badly. Uh, so these patients, um, <coughs> even if they have what looked like a, a grade 3 or even a grade 2 tumour, with a TERP mutation, really they look as though they behave as badly as glioblastomas. So really it's not, would not be appropriate to treat those patients the same way as you might treat these patients who are the good prognosis patients who've got all the good prognostic molecular features that we know about, so the 1P19Q co-deletion, the MGMT methylation, the IDH mutation, etc. Et so this is why we're no longer reliant 
solely on the neuropathologist viewed down the microscope. We really need to know the molecular pathology of these tumours because it makes such a huge difference to outcome. And it very much suggests that you shouldn't be treating all of these patients the same. And it's become apparent that uh, this information often trumps grade. So knowing the molecular character characterization of the tumour will predict better for you than whether it's grade 2 or grade 3, how these patients will do. And that's obviously really important in terms of approach to treatment, but also what you tell the patient, actually, uh, in, these, uh, in these circumstances. So this integrated diagnosis is now uh, the standard approach, and it's the basis for clinical management decisions, but also necessary for all uh, clinical studies, because obviously if you had a clinical study, and you wanted a nice, clean, um, uh, homogeneous patient population, you really wouldn't want to mix these patients with these patients. So if you had a random mix of them, and in your treatment group, with your fancy new agent, you ended up by accident with one of these patients, you would actually skew the data in a very significant way. So you really have to split these groups up. So, clinical studies, what's going on? So this is just a bit of an overview before we dive in it in a bit more uh, detail. So I think most of you are probably aware that we're uh, recruiting more and more names to a long list of negative agents. So things that have been tried, but in most patients anyway, the majority of patients um, haven't worked very well uh, in terms of improving uh, outcome, particularly in the high break tumours, and that includes the um, blood vessel targeting agents, so this is the um, bevacizumab, the Vastin story, and the EGFR targeting drugs, we've had some recent uh, negative studies looking at EGFR targeting, there is um, a new agent, though, that's in studies at the moment that is related to EGFR targeting, which I'll tell you a little bit more about. It's not, it's sort of an indirect EGFR target that looks quite interesting. So I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that study. And then, of course, immunotherapy is everybody's big idea at the moment. Uh, and so I'll, I'll um, go into a little bit more detail about some of those um, studies. So there are some big pharmaceutical company-led studies using the so-called immune checkpoint inhibitors. I'll explain a little bit about what they're supposed to do. And then we've been involved in leads in the uh, oncogenic virus studies, which is a different approach to uh, immunotherapy. The other thing that's coming over the horizon quite quickly is the radiation sensitizing drugs. And I'll tell you a little bit more about those. So these are the repair inhibitors that um, should sensitize uh, tumor cells to the effects of radiation. And then there are some others, some interesting others, and Satavex I'm going to talk about. We run the um, GW Pharma study in Leeds, and it's probably the study I get more questions about than any other. It's one of the smallest studies we've done, uh, but it has caused a lot of interest. So immunotherapy to start with. So the principles of immunotherapy. So the principles are that you harness the patient's innate immune system which all other things being equal should attack a tumour because tumour is abnormal tissue, it should, be, it should be recognised by the immune system and cleared. It doesn't work very well in the brain and that's probably because the brain and the whole and central nervous system is a so-called immune privilege site. So there are a lot of reasons why day to day you do not want active immunity in your brain. Um, and so there, it is a, an immune suppressed site. And there is also evidence that the tumour microenvironment in brain tumours is also rather immunosuppressive. So there are lots of ways in which the immune system in general and the immune cells that you would hope would attack your tumour are turned off within a brain tumour microenvironment. And of course a lot of the therapies that we give patients are also quite immune suppressive. So we know that we, and we suppress the immune system when we give chemotherapy and steroids. There's a little bit of interest, though, in the fact that local radiotherapy may be immune stimulatory, possibly because it, uh, it kills a lot of cells quite quickly, and so it um, releases a lot of abnormal proteins and damaged cell material, which then may wake up the immune system. So there's quite a lot of interest, particularly in using radiotherapy uh, with uh, immune therapy. So how does immune therapy work? Well, these are the general approaches, really, and it's mostly about disinhibiting the local immune response. So trying to switch the local immune response back on so that there are local um, immune cells around the tumour that will actually attack uh, the um, abnormal tumour cells. So you de-repress local immunity, and that's the immune checkpoint inhibitors. That's what these drugs are designed to do. They're designed to inhibit the inhibitory signals that stop your immune system attacking the uh, glioma. 
Obviously, there are other ways of promoting local immunity, so you could deliver something to the tumour that itself is immunogenic, and that's really the idea of using the oncolytic viruses that I'm going to talk about. And of course, you can also promote systemic immunity, so you can, prevent, you can promote immunity in the whole body that would also have an effect on what's going on in, uh, in the brain. And some of the tumour vaccine studies and the activated T cell studies effectively uh, do that. So what's going on in immunotherapy? Well, we've had some um, slightly disappointing uh, news recently from one of the big studies that looked at, this is one of the immune checkpoint inhibitors that was used in a recurrent glioblastoma compared to embevacizumab. Um, and, and the data from that study has been announced recently, and that is a negative study. So they could not demonstrate that this immune checkpoint inhibitor was any better than bevacizumab in recurrent glioblastoma. Bevacizumab is not a very active um, drug. Uh, there are other studies uh, that have been completed, including the DCVAC study, which uh, several uh, uh, UK centres took part in. Uh, we're waiting for data from that. And there are some earlier phase studies that look a little bit more promising with other immune checkpoint inhibitors. This is a, a different uh, immune checkpoint inhibitor. So I think in the next year or two, uh, we will hear more about these agents in, uh, in glioma. At the moment, I think the... Uh, the field is a little bit ambivalent about whether they will be as effective as we had hoped. We don't know. So there, there are some ongoing studies with uh, nivolumab. These are for newly diagnosed patients with uh, glioblastoma, with or without, with radiotherapy, with or without um, tempozolomide chemotherapy. And if you look on clinicaltrials.gov, which is one of the big clinical trials databases, you'll find 92 immunotherapy studies for patients with glioma. So there's a lot of activity going on. That's worldwide, though, not, not just in the UK. So immunotherapy. This is our uh, the real virus study that um, is getting closer and closer to uh, uh, opening. This is uh, we're using one of the oncolytic viruses. This is real virus. This is a virus which is harmless to um, adults uh, that we know will home to the brain if you give it uh, intravenously. Um, and so this study is looking at the addition of uh, real virus with an immune adjuvant GMTSF, which is just a general immune stimulant, for patients who are going through standard of care with a glioblastoma. And um, we're really hoping that that will open in the next, uh, in the next few weeks, and there's going to be four or five centres in the UK uh, who are recruiting to that. Uh, this is just, I won't linger on this in the interest of time, but this is just the, um, uh, the study um, protocol. Uh, so it's basically standard of care with uh, weekly uh, real virus with uh, GMTSF and then continued monthly treatment during adjuvant uh, terms on mind. We also have another um, study funded using the same oncolytic virus which is for patients who have relapsed. Um, and in this case we're trying to make the most of the fact that we think that as I said local radiotherapy itself may be an immune stimulant. So we're doing um, a second course of, of radiotherapy uh, with uh, the real virus and the immune stimulant in, in the hope that the combination of those agents will really promote uh, an immune attack on, uh, on recurrent, uh, recurrent tumours. And what we hope is um, that even though we know we're limited in terms of the radiotherapy dose we can give second time round, that won't matter if at the same time you've got uh, uh, some immune activation. So that study probably isn't going to be open for another year or so. That's immunotherapy. So EGFR, so the ectodermal growth factor uh, receptor. The principles are that this is a very commonly mutated or upregulated growth factor in, in glioma and in lots of other cancers uh, as well. And so the model is that if you inhibit signaling through this growth factor, which sits on the cell surface, you should stop these cells growing because they're really the, that's partly what is driving the growth of these uh, tumours. So you can inhibit this either using small molecule drugs or antibodies, and this approach has been successful, particularly in diseases like breast cancer. Um, or you can target um, signalling from this uh, cell surface receptor, you can target some of the events that happen further down inside the cell, including the mTOR pathway, which is just a, down, a downstream signalling pathway um, downstream from EGFR. Or you could use the receptor molecule itself to deliver other agents, uh, and that's 
one of the studies I'm going to talk in a little bit more detail about, that's quite an elegant study. So again, this is getting a bit repetitive really. Unfortunately, we've had some recent negative, rather disappointing uh, data from some of these studies, particularly um, this study, the ACT4 study, which used um, an, an agent that targeted the uh, mutated form of this growth factor receptor with standard um, chemotherapy, uh, and that failed to meet uh, uh, its endpoints. Um, a smaller phase two study, which was um, targeting some of the downstream signaling from uh, EGFR, was also uh, was also negative. So overall, the EGFR story has been disappointing. But this study, the internal study, which is one of the APNI studies, which is ongoing, uh, looked a little bit more promising. Um, so just to explain a little bit about what uh, what this approach to targeting uh, growth factors. So this is the unstimulated, inactive form of the growth factor sitting on the cell surface. So this is the bit outside the cell, it's the bit inside the cell. This is the bit of the receptor that would signal downstream into the cell. If the growth factor isn't there, this is all shut down. If the growth factor is there, this protein opens up, or if this is mutated, the, for the formation of the protein changes. And that reveals parts of the protein that otherwise would have been hidden. Okay. So in this, in this formation, this part of the protein would not be seen by anything outside the cell. In this formation, that bit of the protein becomes visible. And so, way, so that the way this um, agent is designed is it's an antibody to that specific part of the signaling protein. So the antibody can only bind when the receptor is active or mutated. And when that happens, a, um, joined onto the antibody is a cytotoxic. So what happens is, if the uh, receptor is activated, this protein is available, the antibody binds, the whole thing then gets taken inside the cell, and this cytotoxic is delivered directly inside the cell. So this is EGFR targeting, but also but for stealth delivery of a cytotoxic. It's a very interesting uh, approach. So that agent is in um, phase three uh, clinical studies, and again, there are several centres around the UK who are recruiting patients uh, to this study. I hope I've made it clear that, that you only expect this to work if you have an active receptor or a mutation. Um, and that is not the case in all patients. The estimation is that that might happen in up to 60% of glioblastoma patients. It seems though, now the study's been going for a while, but it may be a bit less than that, and maybe only 30 or 40% of patients uh, who are eligible uh, for this. So the way the study works is that you have to consent patients who are t potentially eligible. You then have to test whether they've got the right mutation or overexpression of this receptor. If they haven't, they can't go into the study. If they have, they can go in and be randomised to this agent or placebo. That brings about an obvious issue, you can imagine, because you're consenting patients who potentially then you have to tell they can't go into the study, which, uh, which is difficult. Ideally, you'd obviously then have another study you could offer them, uh, but we're not always in that, uh, in that situation. Uh, so that's, this is what this study looks like again. It's really, this is standard of care, this is um, chemo radiotherapy. And all that happens is that on week one, week three, and week five of chemo radiotherapy, these patients, in addition, get an infusion of this agent or placebo. Uh, then they have the usual uh, four week gap in treatment. Um, and then monthly, they have uh, a further infusion uh, of the agent. And obviously, they need close monitoring, etc., etc., etc. And the important issue with that study is they continue with the agent until progression. So it's not a defined uh, treatment course. Uh, they continue with the study agent or placebo uh, until there's evidence of uh, uh, progression of change for quite a long time. So this is an interesting agent. I think that there's a lot of interest in how this study will go. It also has a very interesting and very unusual toxicity in that it causes eye toxicity. And those of us who are used to treating patients with chemotherapy think, oh, eye toxicity. Fine, no problem. But if you talk to a patient who's had gritty eyes to the point that they can't read or watch the television for weeks and weeks and weeks, it's actually a really difficult quality of life issue. And I think that's, that's the one disappointing thing about the study, that actually from a patient's perspective, the agent is not as tolerable as you might think. So watch this space for that. 
So the other um, class of agents that I mentioned were the uh, radiation sensitizing agents. These are the drugs that effectively try and prevent the tumor cells recovering from uh, radiotherapy or chemotherapy by targeting DNA repair. So the principle here is that the cells rely on repairing their DNA, which is what, what gets damaged with radiotherapy and chemotherapy. We know that tumor cells in general and glioma cells particularly are more dependent on specific repair pathways compared to the normal brain. And so you should then be able to inhibit some of these specific repair pathways and prevent the tumor cells recovering from the damage from chemo radiotherapy, but not affect the um, tissue. And the main approach to doing that is to use small molecule inhibitors of these specific repair pathways. Um, and the main uh, repair inhibitor that's in uh, clinical studies now, there's a whole series of these studies that are coming through for um, patients um, either in combination with short course radiotherapy for patients who are less well or more elderly, or for patients who are going through standard of care, where you add this repair inhibitor called um, alaparib, which is a PARP inhibitor, um, on the basis that this combination uh, should improve the damage that we deliver to the uh, tumour, uh, but not the normal tissue. And the early data from these studies is that this is a relatively well tolerated uh, drug. Um, and so we're quite hopeful that uh, this agent will improve outcome compared to our, our current approaches. This is in early phase, phase one, uh, phase two, just going into phase two studies around the UK at the moment. So other new agents. So cannabinoids. So this is my Satavix story. Um, Glyna cells and the whole CNS express uh, cannabinoid receptors, otherwise it wouldn't give you any effects if you smoked it. <laughs> Activating cannabinoid signaling may promote glioma cell death. We haven't been involved in this background science, but there is quite a reasonable evidence base um, that um, the autophagy signaling pathway, which is a sort of stress-activated pathway in cells, uh, may be activated by cannabinoid signaling, and that may push tumor cells into um, death. And there's also quite a lot of interesting data suggesting that cannabinoids may enhance the effects of other treatments, particularly temozolomide. And that's probably because temozolomide is quite effective at promoting autophagy. And so if you push the cells a bit harder with an additional autophagy signal, you actually cause more of them uh, to die. And so the approach here is to use cannabinoid um, combinations. And really, obviously, here you're trying to optimize the cytotoxic effects and reduce the CNS side effects. You really don't want psychoactive uh, drugs in this context, really. Um, and then th there's a sort of reuse, uh, repurposing uh, um, paradigm here as well, because a lot of these drugs have been used in other settings. So some of you may have come across them in uh, pain, uh, for um, chemotherapy-induced nausea, etc., etc. Um, and the expectation is that you would need to use these as adjuvants to standard treatment. You, would, you wouldn't expect them to be very effective on that. Oh, so this is a Satavex study. Uh, it ran in a few centres uh, in the UK. It's an early phase study to assess tolerability of a specific combination of cannabinoids with, with um, temozolomide. And this is for patients who have been through standard of care and have recurred. And so we do often re-expose those patients to temozolomide. So this seemed a reasonable, uh, uh, a reasonable question to ask in those in that patient group. The only thing that's slightly different here is that the uh, regime included dose-intense temozolomide, which we don't so commonly use in the UK. So that means that these patients were being treated with temozolomide relatively low doses, three weeks out of four, rather than our standard course, which is one week out of four. So it's a bit more, it's a bit more intense than we would uh, uh, than would be generally used, but um, tolerable. Um, so the cannabinoid mix, I have no idea how they came up with this cannabinoid mix. It was based on work that had gone before, as I said, uh, in other uh, diseases. Um, of course, the, this is um, derived from the cannabis plant. Somewhere in Kent, I believe, I'm not allowed to tell you where, there's a great big <laughs> cannabis farm <laughs> where they make this. Um, and it's an interesting mode of delivery as well. It's given by oral mucosal spray. Um, and it's actually um, individually uh, dosed. So patients titrate that overdose to the point where they get side effects to a maximum level. And that's because it's well described that um, cannab cannabinoid uh, pharmacokinetics are very variable person to person. So one person may be only able to tolerate a few sprays, 
whereas someone else may be able to tolerate uh, a lot more. So they couldn't really fix the dose. So that's how it was done, which was uh, uh, interesting. I've never done a study before where patients decided uh, how much drug they took, but it's fine. Um, it was a, an open label phase one study, so everyone knew what people were getting. Uh, and then it, there was a run in into a randomized uh, uh, phase uh, 1B where there was a placebo spray. So, knew, so nobody knew what, uh, what patients uh, were getting in that phase. So, recurrent GBM, they had to be suitable to be treated with um, temozolomide, they had to be reasonable performance status. Uh, we had to start asking patients questions that we don't always really ask patients about cannabis use, substance abuse, etc., etc. in the past. Uh, a significant um, schizophrenia history was uh, an exclusion, um, as was significant cardiac history because there is some evidence that these agents could um, promote cardiac disease. Um, so, as usual, early phase, so it's partly looking at how these drugs are metabolized, how, where they turn up in the blood, etc., etc. But in the randomized phase, they were interested in looking at um, survival. So this study recruited relatively uh, quickly. It started in uh, the early uh, 2014 and finished in June uh, 2015. Um, and the preliminary data have been reported uh, by the company in a press release in March this year, which is why patients are interested in it now. This is a small um, study, uh, but it did look as though the, in the randomized uh, portion of the study, the patients who received the cannabinoid did do significantly better in terms of um, overall survival than patients who had dose dose temozolomide alone. Far too early to say whether that uh, will be uh, substantiated. There needs to be another study. There will be another study. That's going to take a little bit of time. Um, and those data are going to be submitted this year at the um, American Clinical Oncology meeting. Um, and yeah, GWF thinking about what the next study should look like. I think it, would also, it will also probably be in recurrent, uh, in patients with recurrent iron. In the, at the, to finish, I just wanted to think about this issue about, well, that's great, there are all those clinical studies out there. A lot of them are not recruiting huge patient numbers. A lot of them are only running in a few centres around the UK. So how do you access clinical studies? How do you know what's out there? And I think it's a bit more challenging than you might think, actually, because a lot of these studies um, sort of get hidden a bit, particularly if they're run by pharmaceutical companies only in a couple of only in a couple of centres. Even in the research community, we don't always know exactly what's going on in all the centres that are around the UK. But there are some there are some useful databases that can help. So first of all, obviously, your local oncology team probably have some idea and some contacts. Uh, in terms of what's going on locally, if not very locally, then in the, uh, in the immediate surrounding area. And there are also some useful national databases, so uh, the NCRI database, um, and then this is uh, an NHS uh, clinical trial uh, database. There is useful information there. I think, as always with those sorts of databases, you cannot rely on them being 100% up to date, and you cannot rely on them including absolutely uh, everything. And clinicaltrials.gov is the one that I often go to. It's the <coughs> big international database. Uh, so it's massive. Uh, but you can, you can um, search by disease and you can search by uh, country. Um, so, so that's quite a useful one to look at if you really want a broader overview of what's going on. And then, of course, some of the funding organisations and the support groups have also done a lot of work trying to uh, maintain a useful database uh, uh, for researchers. Uh, patient groups, carers, etc., etc. So, um, Cancer Research UK has got one. I will say last time I looked, it wasn't up to date. Uh, and the Brain Tumor Charity uh, have got a useful one as well. Um, as do the Brains Trust uh, as a support group. So, I think o overall there's a useful database there, but it's hard to say that there is just one place that you can go to uh, to be certain that you capture all the activity. Uh, all the activity that is there. So I think with that, I'll finish having moved at the end. Thank you very much.